Hello. I'm happy to be here and uh, really happy to talk and to reflect on uh, trying to harness something that's inside of us, and that is that power that we all have to love. We also have power to hate, and we have power to give and power to be selfish. So we just want to reflect a little bit this evening, and I want to start by just saying that one sentence. Here's my name. <laughs> Right in the very first chapter of Genesis in the Bible, uh, God is speaking and God says, uh, let us make people, let us make man in our image and likeness. Let us make people in our image. So if we believe that, then we believe that you and I are made in the image of God. And it's really good to take a minute to reflect on that because if we think about sort of the creative energy of God, we're learning more and more about the universe, but we still only know 0.4% of the universe that God has created. But billions and billions and billions of miles of creation and stars, and people, and earth, and just the intricacies of the little animals and flowers, the creative beauty and depth of God's wisdom, that it has been planted in each of our hearts and souls, that we are made with the same powers, not maybe the extent, but we have the same power and that brought God made life come into the world. And that you and I have the power to bring life into the world. It's very, very sacred and very, I would say, very profound. We don't think of it, but it's so profound that we have that power to bring somebody to life and to nurture that life, to protect that life, to affirm it, to make it grow, and, and to give it its own self to go out into the world and do the same. So tonight we've been asked to talk about harnessing that power, because not many people are talking to us about the fact that we have this in us. We have very, very deep energies of maternity and paternity. Very, very deep energies that have been planted in us. And if we don't use them, then they go latent. And I think we're going to give you some, some uh, ideas about what's being said about our dominant culture. But our dominant culture isn't excited about the fact that we have all this depth of wisdom and beauty and power and goodness. So there's a poet, Mar um, Marie Oliver, and she said in the, in the poem called The Summer Day, she says this, tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. You have one wild and precious life. And you are the one, and I am the one, that determines how that's going to be lived. And the kind of energies that I'm going to put forth into the world and into other people, and I have that choice. So I, I want to talk about that, and I want to try to, to help you to uh, get a hold of it more and to respect more what you have and to think about what it is that your contribution is going to be in life giving to others in the world. And are you going to be a life giver or are you going to be a death force? Because we have that power as well, as we well know in our world today. And we have uh, an image that I love and it's this picture which you can't see. 
<laughs> which is very, very beautiful. And uh, it's a Rembrandt painting of the story in the Gospel of the Return of the Prodigal Son. The story in the Gospel is that this father has two sons. The young one is disillusioned, so he comes to his father and says, could you please give me my part of the estate because I really can't wait until you die. So it's a very, very great insult. Could you give it to me now because I want it for myself and for my selfish uh, desires. I can't stand it anymore. I'm so disillusioned. I want to get out of here and I want to test drive uh, the powers that I have in the world. And it's, it just says his father divided the estate and gave him his, his inheritance. So the guy leaves and it said he went to a far off place where he lived a life of uh, spending, of debauchery, of just uh, wasting until it was gone. <laughs> and when it was gone, of course, all the friends that he had made along the way were also gone, and uh, he was hungry. <clears throat> so he gets a job feeding the pigs on a farm, and it says that he wanted to eat what the pigs ate, but no one would give him the food. So uh, he's in this terrible situation, disillusioned now in another way, saying, I've had my fling, but now I'm disillusioned again. Life, life shouldn't be like this. And you know, in my father's house, the servants have better quarters and better food than I have, so I'm going to go back and just be a servant in my father's house. And he comes home to his father. He turns, he makes the journey, he comes back. And when he's very far off, his father sees him because he's been searching for him. And he runs out, throws his arms around him, welcomes him as a son, brings him in, kills the fatted calf, and they have a celebration to welcome his son home. And he doesn't say one word about what his son has done, about the insult, or not a word of reproof, just welcome, welcome home. So that's the, the one son he can help us because he's a man who was disillusioned in life. And I'm sure that all of us here have experienced disillusionment. And what do we do with it? And how do we uh, respond to the fact that inside I feel uh, depressed or angry or upset because I can't change what is real? in my life, that I have been maybe in a relationship that has broken and my heart is broken, or I have been wanting a relationship and I haven't found the right person, or I have got this really good job but I'm not happy. So there's, there's a, this experience of disillusionment which we've had and we see that one person just takes off and lives for pleasure, but still isn't satisfied. There's another son in, the, in this story, and that guy stays home. And he looks after his father's estate, and uh, he helps with the, he's the elder son, and he looks after the father's estate. And when the, when the younger son comes home, the elder son is very, very upset and upset with the behavior of the father who welcomes him. So he's out in the field and he he'll, hears that there's going to be a celebration and uh, he won't come home, he won't come in. He's very angry. And so his father goes out and says to him, you know, we want you to come to the celebration and he's not coming. He says, that son of yours who took our money, spent it all, in the life of wastefulness. I'm not coming in. I'm not. So here's another man who was disillusioned in a situation that he couldn't control. He couldn't control the generosity of his father, which made him angry. 
that he couldn't control the homecoming welcome made him very angry. So what does he turn to? He turns to anger and resentment. And he won't come in. In other words, maybe he is farther away from home than his younger brother inside. That he's left the, the home of a loving father. And he's now in a place of anger and disillusionment and selfishness. <coughs> So the father goes out to him and says, please come in. And he says, that son of yours, he's, he took all our wealth, he did it, and now you've killed the fatted calf. And the father says, your brother was lost and is found. He was dead, and he's come to life. So the, the son doesn't see any relational quality here. He's that son of yours. He's not my brother. That son of yours. Keep him at a distance. And the father is saying, your brother was dead and is, is now alive. So we have to take a look at each of these characters, but also we want to take a look at the father. Because the father was disillusioned also. Just imagine that young upstart coming and asking for his inheritance. And I would say in those days, it was probably much, much more of an insult than it might be today. Because the young people didn't have the same independence in those times. So the, the absolute uh, insult of that young man to dare to speak to his father that way, give me my money. I wish you were dead, but you're not, so I'm taking the money. Just give me it, give me it, I, I need it for me, I'm selfish. And the father had to be very disillusioned that that's what happened to the son that he loved and raised. But he didn't become angry. He divided his inheritance. He gave his son the money. He didn't say, don't go. He let him go. And he knew that he would probably be hurt. And he knew that he would probably be in danger. And he knew that he might even lose him. But he was affirming his son to say, you have a mind now. You're an adult. You're going to do what you're going to do. And I will wait for you. And if you come back, I'm here for you. He did not let that anger get inside his heart and corrode it. There's a, a saying by a poet called Rumi. who's was an ancient Persian poet. And he said, anger corrodes the vessel that holds it. So this father had to be angry, or he had to be upset, he had to be disillusioned, and he had to be very, very sad. But the young man took off and he let him go without, uh, without a fury and without, a, without telling him what he thought. And then living with that older son who was full of resentment, who uh, really looked like the good guy because he stayed home, he worked hard, he looked good. And of course the neighbors would say, well, you're the, you're the good son, you stayed home, you didn't take your inheritance. And all the time he's seething with rage about his brother because he let that anger come into his heart. And he didn't harness the fact, the power that was there to be able to step through his pain and say, my brother deserves a second chance. He didn't do that. So let's, we, we see these three characters and of course the father in this painting and the father in the parable, if you, if you have a chance, come and look at this. It's a beautiful 
uh, painting that was done by Rembrandt. And uh, it, the father in the painting is the representative of God, of course, who is love. And all through the gospel, we see this man, Jesus, who is God's son, meeting people who have what, what our church has told us are sins, which are against God, things that are just as bad as insulting the Father. And we see the way Jesus meets people along the way. So he meets a woman taken in adultery. And uh, just when they say, you know, let's, let's get her, we have to stone her. That's what Moses said. He just starts scribbling in the sand. And uh, then people are saying, come on, come on, we got to do this. So, you know, what? And uh, he stands up and says, let the first one who didn't ever sin throw the first stone. And then they start walking away. And he says to the woman, did anybody condemn you? And she says, no. He said, well, I don't either. He meets the woman who had five husbands. And he's so gentle and so delicate and so kind. He says, if I could just tell you that there's living water, that is, there's, there's beauty, there's, there's power within, within you to give life to other people. If I could just convince you of that, then you wouldn't be looking for love in all the wrong places. And she stays in conversation with him. And he says, go call your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, that's right. Because you've had five. Because you were disillusioned in love. Because you were so much searching for love. Because you wanted so much those powers of love inside of you to be realized in, in relationship with somebody else. He's not saying you shouldn't have had five husbands. He's saying, I understand that you have the power to love and you want to love, and sometimes you've made mistakes along the way. But if you think about this, if you think about the power that you have, you can really, you can be like a fountain of water, really giving life to other people. She leaves her jug on the well and she goes to this town where she's a disgrace. And she says, come and meet this man. Come and meet him. She becomes an apostle. She becomes a loving person right there in the story. She just takes these powers that she has and goes out and says, I don't care what they think of me. They have to meet him so that they can also learn to love. So what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? And what am I going to do? Because we have the... We have these energies. And there is a lot of disillusionment. And there's a lot of pain. And we have to give our response to that. We have to decide, am I going to be very angry? Am I going to live in depression? Or is there still good that I can do? Can I still find happiness in my relationship with other people? Can I step over the pain to meet somebody else who is disillusioned and give them affirmation? We have power. We have power to give birth to a baby, but we also have power to give life to other people by looking at them, by affirming them, by saying, you're a good person by saying, come on, stand up. We need you. We can do that for one another. And I, I really encourage you to consider in your own person when you're, when you're alone and when you're thinking. You are a beautiful person created by God. And God loves you. God has loved you since before you were born. God made you very, very unique not like anybody else in the whole world. That's how creative God is. Seven billion people, and not two of us, that have had the same experiences or have the same inside, the same interiority. But each of us with all this power that has been given to us and that we can use 
in our relationships, in our offices, and especially in our families with people who are difficult, who drive us crazy. And I'll just end with a, a little story. Um, I worked at a community called Marsh Daybreak, and uh, we, we welcome people with intellectual disabilities. And uh, so we have different houses and we live together. And it's very challenging and very wonderful. It's fun and it's terrible. It's great and it's horrible. <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it, was really, it was really an experience. I was there for 40 years, so I had a lot of experience. And uh, people, young people like yourselves came and they gave a year. And they would live in the house with five or six people with disabilities and just create home together. So how do we create home? We cook together, we help each other, uh, we try to bring out the gifts of each person so that each person can contribute and can feel valued and, and so on. And uh, so people would come, young assistants, and, and we, were, we would meet. So this one woman came, and she was 19, and she uh, was in a class uh, on disability training at Waterloo. So she, she came and uh, she was going to do a four-month training placement. And uh, she was quite big and very, just a bit of an angry edge and sort of right in your face, you know, just right there. So she uh, started out and about four or five days after she got there, she began to tell us how bad we were at what we were doing, <laughs> that we weren't doing it right at all and that she knew better because she was in school and she had all the answers. So anyway, we were trying to just, I liked her a lot. She just had a lot of energy and a lot of life and so on. And, and so um, as she got into things, she was not spiritual at all. She didn't like prayer. She didn't like God. She didn't like people talking about God. And uh, so we, we used to pray at night around the table and nobody had to stay if they didn't want to, so she'd always leave. But anyway, they asked me if I would, what we call accompany her. So I had to meet her uh, every once a month and just say, how are you doing? And of course, she would tell me how the community was doing. It was doing so badly because everything we did was wrong. And she knew that and she wanted us to change everything. So we got through that a little bit. And, and as I say, I really liked her because she was, she was really alive. And, uh, so this one day, she, as she was leaving after, her, I would say after about a year, she said uh, something about her, her fiance. And I said, your fiance? I said, I didn't even know you were going with somebody. And she said, well, I'm not. And I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, he, she said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna marry him. And I, and I said, well, where is he? And she said, well, I haven't met him yet. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And she said, well, his, his name is Sven, and he's going to come from, from Denmark, and he's going to be tall and blonde, and he's going to be a really nice guy, and I'm going to marry him. So I said, you haven't met him? And she said, no. And I said, well, good luck, and that works out. So that was fine, and, and every time I saw her, we, I would always ask her about Sven, and of course he was never in the picture, until Ben, arrived from Holland, who was tall and blonde, and her eyes were just rolling every time she was in the same room with him, and uh, they began to see each other, and uh, again, they, they both stayed in the community for a long time. They were, she was really very, very good person. She was a good assistant, and she grew a lot, and uh, and then she said to us, you know, I haven't done anything for the world. She said, maybe I could go to a Marsh community in the third world and help there because they don't have any money and they don't have assistance. And so uh, we wrote to India and we wrote to the <coughs> communities in, the, in Honduras and so on. Nobody needed anybody, but there was a community just down the road uh, near Ottawa that, that was desperate. So we said, why don't you go there for the year? So she went and then he stayed at daybreak and he went back and forth and uh, they were courting by that time and then they got engaged and they got married. And they left after they got married, which we encouraged. So they, found, they moved to Cambridge and they were 
uh, had work and they were moving along and so on and dying to have a baby, dying to have a baby. They just wanted children. They wanted a whole bunch of children. And she had several miscarriages. And uh, so anyway, uh, at one point she said to him, you know, I, I have so much pain. She said, I think I'm having an appendix attack. And uh, so he took her to the hospital and the doctor said, you're four months pregnant. And uh, she was just overjoyed. They were so shocked and so overjoyed. She, she really was longing to have a child. So the, uh, they released her from emergency and then they got a call that night and the doctor said, I'd like you to come back tomorrow. And uh, so she went back and he said, we need to do some tests because the tests that came out weren't too good. So they did some tests over the next couple of days and they discovered that the baby was not a baby who was going to be able to survive after it was born. It was a baby whose brain was growing outside of its head at the back and uh, there was no way the, the baby could survive. So she was four months, going on five months, and of course, she, they went to um, Master Hospital, which is, they have a big clinic there, and uh, the doctor, of course, said, you need to have an abortion now, because it's, it's almost too late. And uh, so they were just this, young couple and they wanted children and, and they were so overwhelmed. But anyway, they said, well, you know, we're not, we're not afraid of having a handicapped child because we've been working with people who have handicaps, so we're not afraid of that. So why would we have an abortion? I mean, let's just bring it to term and see what happens. And so the doctor was so adamant that uh, it was very, very hard for them. <coughs> But it was a very difficult time. It was such a hard pregnancy because they wanted, they kept hoping. And then every time they'd go to the doctor, there was a, a, a confirmation that the baby would, would not be able to survive. 15 minutes, probably. So they brought the baby to term. And I, I must say, some of the couples that were with us in the community, met with them over this period of time just to talk with them, to listen to them, and to support them along the way because it was so hard. Just the two of them, both longing for a child and kind of looking forward to having a child who would die. So uh, the time came, they prepared her and they did a, a C-section and the baby was born and um, was alive and so on, gave it to the father, Ben, and he, they cleaned it all and gave it to, uh, to um, Lori. And uh, so they baptized it and they were all set that it would die and it didn't die. So they called him Lucian. And uh, so that night, they sent them back out of the, um, um, the um, delivery section. They sent them back to a room. And they said, we'll put a cot here for Ben. So Ben and the doctor came in and he said, in cases like this, he said, it's so good for the baby who could not eat or drink, couldn't open his lips, he couldn't eat or drink, if you have skin on skin, because he said that the child is maybe cold, but this is, this is the best way, skin on skin. So Ben took the baby and put him on his chest, and then he got a blanket and wrapped it, wrapped it around, and he slept that night with Lucien on his chest. And uh, in the morning, the baby was still alive. So, the next day, the baby was still alive, and uh, so they began to invite people, and we could go and see the baby. We met, we met him. We went to meet him. And the doctor said, "There's no hope. He can't eat, 
can't drink. So, any day, any, any moment. But the baby lived, so four days, and they said, well, you might as well go home and take the baby home. But he's, he's going to die. And he said, I'll give you a doctor in Cambridge who will relate to you. And uh, so they went home to Cambridge. One of the couples went and set up. They had no nursery in their home or anything. They set it all up for them. And uh, this little baby was just held for 17 days without food or water. He lived for 17 days. And they said that he was not more than 15 minutes out of the arms of somebody during those 17 days, that he was held for all those 17 days. And it was so hard, as you can imagine, for the parents. Ben was a gardener, and he, it was springtime, it was in March or April, and he'd take Lucien out into the garden, and he was putting his hands in the dirt and showing him every day and what it was like and everything. They were just madly in love with him. And he never did a thing. He didn't accomplish anything. And the doctor would come and say, I can't believe that he's still alive. And uh, finally, when he just got to about the 16th day, that he had a seizure. And so then they said to the doctor, did we make the wrong decision? Is he going to suffer? We don't want that. And what can we do? And the doctor said, no, I can, I can help him. He said, we'll just give him a little tiny medication with a shot in the arm. And he said, that'll temper the seizures and so on. And then he died on the 17th day. The people in our woodworking shop, the men and women with disabilities, and the people who knew Laurie and Ben and Lucien made the casket out of pine wood. And uh, in our chapel, we had the, the little funeral celebration. I said to, we said to Ben and Laurie, did you want to talk at his funeral? Do you want to say anything? And they said, yes, we do. And so Ben got up, tall, blonde, just such a nice guy, and so, so strong, and so, and he just began to talk, and he said, uh, Lucien has made me a father. And he said, uh, I'll always be a father now. And he said, Lucien isn't here, but I'm going to be a father for the rest of my life. And he taught me about how to be a father. And it's to love beyond everything you see. And he said, I, I'm, I'm going to do that. That's what I'm going to be. And he said, I just, I make that pledge at his funeral. I'm going to be a father. And uh, he said, when I, when I held him in my arms, he said, I never loved anybody as much as I loved that baby. He said, my heart was just absolutely throbbing and beating. And uh, so everybody in the, in the place was crying. It was so sad. It was so hard. And then Laurie got up and she said, you know, I just said, I'm not going to have my baby. I'm not going to be Googling and, and fussing and doing all that. But she said, my baby's going to just grow up and going to be sane and not have all that foolish stuff. She said, it took me about three seconds before I was just saying, oh, look at him, he's so beautiful. She said, I was just Googling over him all the time and tickling him and trying to get him to laugh. And she said, I lost my whole sense of self by this child who brought so much out of me, even though he was going to die. She said, I never, never left my brain. He's not going to be here, so we have to use every moment. I wanted to tell that story because they could have been bitter. And they were very, very frightened to try to have children again. But now they have four beautiful children. And their family, they're gorgeous kids, and the, and the family is happy, and they're and Lucien's pictures in their living room, that they remember him. You and I are made in the image of God. 
We have creative energies for love, for goodness, for affirmation, for confirmation, for meeting people, for relationships. And those energies help us in times of difficulty and pain. You have suffered, and I know you have, and I have suffered. And we don't understand suffering. We don't, we don't have an answer for suffering. Most of suffering is undeserved. So they lost their baby. They didn't deserve it, but it happened. And we don't understand it. But the, the wonderful thing is that we have a choice to come out of our suffering by being caring and loving and deep with wisdom and goodness, or we have other choices to make that make us angry and aggressive and hurtful. So with this tonight, maybe you'll harness your power. You have a lot of power to love. Thank you.